Well, good morning, Eastridge. We're so glad that you could join us today. For those of you who are in person, as well as those online, um, if you're comfortable, why don't you stand and join us as we worship our Lord this morning. sin and death. We just thank you, Lord, that you have won. Thank you, Lord, that you have cleansed us from all of our sin and unrighteousness, that we are made holy in front of you. We just want to bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen, and you may be seated. It is great to be with you here this morning, family. Uh, as many of you would have heard probably seven, eight, nine times over, over the last couple of days, Ontario is headed into another stay-at-home lockdown uh, order, in which case uh, we will be enjoying and uh, continuing on with church online from this point over the next probably five or six weeks. So we'd encourage you to keep tuning in from home at 9.30 uh, every Sunday morning, and we look forward once again, uh, whether we are together in the room, whether we are at our homes, uh, just being bound together through the Holy Spirit, bound together through what Jesus has done, and able to lift an offering of praise to the Lord. We have a couple things that we'd like to draw your attention to this morning. Uh, the first is that starting on Tuesday, we are going to be launching our Kids Quest online program. So if parents, you haven't had a chance to sign up yet, you can email kids at eastridge.ca. And over the next 10 weeks, I believe, we are going to have the opportunity to gather kids together, to have them uh, have a time of fellowship activity, and that'll be every Tuesday night from 7 till 8 p.m. We're also looking towards our Walk for Restore. For those of you who don't know, Restore is uh, an organization that functions right here in Stouffville uh, that helps those who are in need, help with benevolence requests, and not just uh, giving out resources, but helping people really get back on their feet. We have the opportunity to do a walk to help raise money and help support the ministry that once again provides a real need in our community and uh, we've created a team for that and the first donation has already come in. So we'd ask that uh, if you have the opportunity to sign up as a part of the team to help raise some money for that and contribute to that and once again it's something that changes lives right here in this town which is so amazing to be a part of. So once again all the information for that can be found online. So this morning, as uh, we just spend a moment and bow in prayer, we're going to pray for our offerings. Here at Eastridge, we have a number of different ways to give. You can give through e-transfers, you can give online, or your donations can be mailed in to the church. So over the next number of weeks, that's how we will be, uh, once again, supporting and giving. So this morning, uh, I invite you to take your phone, your checkbook, or even just hold out your hands wherever you are, and just leave those in an open posture. As uh, once again, Ray shared with us a number of weeks ago, 
the more loosely we hold what God gives us, the more room he has to place within our lives and within the resources that we have. So this morning, let's just take a minute, let's pray, and then Pastor Ray is going to come up and lead in the preaching of the word this morning. Dear Father God, we thank you that you are a constant, that you are at work, that you are working to just continue to redeem the world that we live in. Lord, it's so easy to become discouraged with what we see, with what we hear, but we know that we belong to a power greater than that of the world. We know that the things that we are struggling through, uh, however heartbreaking and overwhelming they can be, are temporary. And Lord, that there's always opportunity ahead of us through that which you are making, designing, and building. So this morning, Father God, as we come before you, we bring ourselves as offerings. Lord, that you would reach in our lives, that you would remove what needs to be removed, that you would place what needs to be received, that you would guide, that we would listen and hear your voice for the great and mighty things that you have planned and how we will be a part of that journey. So Lord, this morning we come to you, we thank you for all that you have done, and in your most holy and gracious name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Sam. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church and those online. Good to see you. You can see me. I can't see you. That's okay. <laughs> Something that has been coming up on my heart only because I had a good conversation this, earlier this week with someone. And part of that conversation entailed thinking about those, you know, where those pop-up vaccine um, areas are. It's popping up in those areas because it's prevalent and those people are dealing because they have to work. And so they're going to work and then they're, you know, uh, the virus is still spreading around. And just to keep those people in mind. But we're going to do something um, a little different. You know, even as just Pastor Sam was mentioning, um, the spirit is what's binding us together. And even during worship, I was looking at this verse. Colossians 2, um, verse 5 says... Paul's writing this, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit. And through the course of this year, this, this verse has come up into my, my studying and just thoughts from the Lord. That even though we can't meet in person, there are some here, but those of you who are online, I haven't seen you in a while. But then there's those who are around in our, in our province, in our city. And I want to take a moment today to kind of refresh our minds I know about a year ago, we had gone through a series on Psalm 91, and it was a powerful time, and that's something that we haven't touched upon as much, um, but hopefully you have been meditating on it at some point uh, throughout this past year. But something I want to do differently right now is I'm going to read through it, and if you have it with you, you want to pull it up and follow along, by all means, but at the same time, if you don't, and you want to just close your eyes. Let's take this moment as a moment to pray, to pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our city, those areas where those hot spots are. Let's pray a prayer of protection over these people. You know, this is our, our job because we have this connection with the Lord and that he always hears our prayers. Amen? So if you would, Psalm 91, it starts by saying this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. 
No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, we just thank you that even as the, with you, the reading of your word, that you are present, that you are the one who protects us, who keeps us in all our ways. And even in a few chapters after that, I thank you, Lord, that even your angels heed the voice of the word, is what your word says. So thank you, Lord, for your round-the-clock protection for our families, our church, our church family, our community, this town, our city, Lord, our country. We thank you that there is nothing that is too big for you to handle. And through the midst of it all, you are working all things out for our good. And we rest in that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for letting me uh, read that to you. So this week, we are continuing our series through the life of Caleb. Just looking at who he is and what he's done. Um, he's unique and I think there's much to learn from his life. Last week we had heard about how the, the greatest ordeal, where he first came on the scene, the first mention of this name, Caleb, in the Bible, and how he was one of the 12 spies who went and spied out the land, the promised land, one of two people who gave a, a very good report. And even though there was 12 of them, and only two were able to give a good report, they saw the same things. How is that possible that they saw the same giants, they saw the, the great walls, the same good land, good food and fruits that were there, but yet 10 of them were afraid and only two, and Caleb was one of them, that said, let's go up and take this land because the Lord is with us. We can overcome them. You know, it, this, this, this idea of looking at his faith that he that was over all over him in, in, in how he talked and how he acted and how he responded. It was his life of faith, and he was thriving in that. But because of those ten who gave a bad report, what happened? Everyone, everyone that was twenty years and up was never able to go into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb. And so we're going to be picking up in, in Joshua chapter 14 today, um, and we're going to be looking at what Caleb da, does um, after those 40 years of wandering in the desert. Okay, so if you have uh, your Bible with you, Joshua chapter 14, words will be on your screen. And we'll just pick up in verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. We're going to stop there, but prior to this, the, the Israelites go into the promised land, and they are conquering over all the enemies in the land, all the squatters that were in the promised land, and they've conquered many. I think a couple of chapters prior to this in the book of Joshua, it says that um, then they've conquered, and the land was at rest from war. And then in, in the previous chapter, in chapter 13, God actually says to Abram, I mean, not to Abram, to Joshua, you are old and advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. 
And even though there was no war, they've conquered a lot. What's he saying there? That there's still much land to possess. Even though that this land is given to them and they've conquered a lot of it, if not all of it, there's still things to be possessed. What does that mean? Like they, they haven't actually taken over it all. Like there's still um, room to move forward and possess it, to, to actually use it. I think there's a Proverbs um, that talks about a lazy man who, even though he hunts and he kills, but yet he just lets the carcass rot in, in an in a area, in the den. It's because he was lazy. So he didn't possess what he had already caught. And it's in the same mind, even though the wars have ended, the land is at rest from war, but there is much land to be actually possessed. There's still much to do, but yet he's old and advanced in years. That's Joshua. But then you have this man named Caleb, and as we've just read in chapter 14, verse 6, this is, well, he'll say this eventually, we'll see it, but this is now 45 years after they've been conquering, wandering, and then now they're in here for the past five years, okay? And now he's saying, he's dividing up the land, as God said to Joshua, divide up the land as an inheritance to all the, 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 the Israelites there. And it comes to jo- uh, Caleb, who's from the tribe of Judah. Do you know that tribe? You know who else comes from that tribe? Jesus comes from that tribe, right? So it's a very important tribe here. And so Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he says, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses. You know the word. You know, a lot of times um, when we listen to a pastor, a preacher, we'll listen, we'll know what they say. You'll know what some other preacher will say or other pastor. But the question that I have for you today is, do you know the word? And I'm not saying that as a you know, condemn, condemning way, but it's something that we ought to be knowing for ourselves, to be looking at our, for our own eyes, for our own consumption. You know, last week when I was talking about how uh, Caleb said, they're bread for us. And I talked about, hey, th- this is also our bread. I should tell you, that was not to condemn you. You know, you you shouldn't feel condemned because you're not reading this. And you've probably heard me say this. You should feel hungry. This is bread. You should feel hungry, just like your physical body needs, uh, feels hunger when it, you know, it needs sustenance. And so at the same time, that's what this is. And so he says, you know the word. So he's kept this in his heart. He knows this for himself. You know the Lord, a word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me. Concerning you and me. When we read this, when you eat of this bread, the bread of life here, you got to see, one, where's Jesus? Okay? Jesus said himself, on the road to Emmaus, he expounded all the words, all the Old Testament to those two disciples walking on this road, expounding everything concerning himself. So that means for us, we need to find Jesus in all of this. In every page, every word, every verse, let's look for Jesus first and foremost. Secondly, what does it say concerning you and I? What is God... What has God given to us? We need to know. We need to know it for sure because the enemy comes and tosses thoughts at you to see how you react. Yeah, circumstances are tough. The world is crazy right now. How do we respond? In fear? There are many. But just that's why we stood our ground on Psalm 91 and we want to start that service this way because we need to know what is ours and who is ours. Or better yet, someone, so I remember someone saying it this way, whose you are, who are we, who do we belong to, who's backing us up? It's the Lord God, amen? And so he says, I know, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. He was 40 years old, okay? 40 years old. He was in his prime, if you want to put it that way, when, the Moses, when Moses sent him out to spy out the land. And then when he came back, look at how he says this, how he ends verse 7. 
And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. So he knew what the word was for him, for, for all of them, that God was giving them a land, giving them a land to inherit as their inheritance, a land flowing with milk and honey. He took it in his heart that Lord, the God is saying, this is yours. Yes, there are going to be squatters in the land, but don't fret, don't worry, I will take care of them. And so he brought it back as it was in his heart. And so what did we say last week? Let us go up at once, let us take that land. We are well able, they are bred for us. The Lord is with us, why are we to be afraid? So this is what's in his heart, he knows who he is and what God has said. And so it's what he's, um, what he's meditating on his heart is the report that he gave back is what he's saying. If you want to bring up verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Do you realize everything is dealing with their heart? Does it sound familiar in the Proverbs? Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Everything is dealing with the heart. The ten spies who gave a bad report, it's because in their hearts they saw themselves as small little grasshoppers. Remember how I told you last week? They didn't go to those giants and say, do you see us like grasshoppers? No. They thought of, it, they thought of themselves as that way, and that's how it was. Okay? How they saw themselves, but it was in their heart. And now he's saying here that it's because of that bad report that it discouraged the people and it melted their heart. And then, so that's why prior I said, he gave a report, the good report Caleb gave, was from his heart. Everything is dealing with how you see on the inside. Yes, physically we can see everything. And obviously that seems more real to you because you can feel it, you can touch it, you can see it, you can smell it all our senses, but yet God is not asking you to always just use your senses. He's saying, look to me, use my word, this bread, enjoy it. Look to see how I see things, how I see you. That's more important. And it says that he wholly followed the Lord, and we'll come back to that. Okay. And now verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said these 45 years. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war both for going out and for coming in. So there's a good report in his heart, and he's saying, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. I want you to pay attention to that. The Lord has kept me alive. Caleb focuses on something very important here. Yes, we have doctors, and that is fantastic. They are there because God has designed it that way. He's given them wisdom. Okay, so listen to your doctors. But even let's say you go for a surgery, who do you think keeps you alive? The doctor or God? It's still the Lord that keeps you alive. He uses the people, but he's still the one who gives you the breath of life. And so this is what Caleb's focusing on. The Lord is the one who has kept me alive all these years, and he's been wandering in the desert. Okay? He already knew what God's word says, that everywhere you've gone, it's going to be yours. You're going to be one of two that will enter into this promised land. He knew the word, but he endured the wandering. That being said, notice how I said wandering. 
there's a difference between walking and wandering. Walking is deliberate. Walking, you know where you're going to go. Wandering, you're just walking aimlessly. And that's unfortunate. But he endured the wandering all the way through. And so now when they're divvying up the land as their inheritance, he knows who he is. He's making a plea to Joshua now. And he said to him that even though now he's 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke, it's easy for me to say, hey, it doesn't matter what age you are. God's not done with you yet. It's true. It doesn't matter how old we are, how much we've gone through, how bad things might be or how good things might be. There's still something the Lord can use you for, for his glory. And we want to be a part of that. So even though Caleb is 85 years old, verse 11, as yet I am strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. I'm going to say something here that might <laughs> cause you to think, nah, it can't be. Do you think Caleb aged? He's 85 years old, right? But at the same time, it, said, it does say in the previous chapter that Joshua aged. He was old and advanced in years. But there's nothing in the scripture that says Caleb aged. It's almost as though he remained the same. Because think about it. He's saying, as yet I am as strong this day as was on the day that Moses sent me. So now my strength for war both going in and both coming out. He is still as strong as he was when he was 40 years old. It's almost as though, yeah, he didn't age. Very interesting. And you might be thinking, no, that's spiritual strength. But he just said that my strength is still the same now for war. War is not just something that's airy-fairy. All right, this is real. And for his daily going and coming. It was as though he held on, because he held on to the word of God, that all of a sudden, things didn't change for him. Anyways, that's just an observation. But something to think about. Because even now, I think of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are his benefits? Who forgives you of your iniquities, forgiveness, who heals you of your diseases, who crowns your um, life with loving kindness, who redeems your life from destruction. And what's that last one? Your youth is renewed like the eagles. Very interesting, right? Even physically, an eagle is technically the only bird that you see where it can shed its feathers, and it has a renewed body in that sense, right? Very, very interesting. Just putting it out there, okay? Like, that the Lord will sustain. And so he goes forth, and he's saying, I am as strong as I was that day. And look at his claim now. Verse 12, please. Now, therefore... Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. You heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. So he's saying, I'm as strong as I was when I was 40 years old. Now give me this mountain. What mountain is this? Mount Hebron. Okay, through the scripture, you kind of see Hebron. This is where the giants were. He mentions Anakims. Those are uh, uh, when you see, uh, you hear David and Goliath. Goliath is a, a descendant of the Anakims. Okay, it's these giants in the land. But he's saying, now give me this mountain. Now, most times when we th talk about mountains, we think of it as a problem, an issue that we have to deal with. But look on the flip side. Even though, yes, there is the problem, okay? There's giants in the land, fortified walls that he has to go and possess and take over. What else is in this mountain? It's his inheritance. It's his blessing. 
It's the goodness that God is giving to him. So yes, we have issues that we deal with in life and we will refer to those issues as mountains. But what if we did a perspective change? Instead of seeing them as a mountain that, that is always trouble, but that, it, that it's actually bread. That God, on the other side of this, your victory is there. That there is something that you have given to me and this is, in a sense, um, whatever the world is tossing, whatever the enemy is tossing at us, it will be used to level up. It will be used to increase my faith. See, notice the slight perspective change. It's never about, this is too much for me to handle, but saying, no, no matter how insurmountable this is, God, I am trusting you. And when you start looking into this, you find those promises and you chew on them and you meditate on them and you hold it in your heart. Because remember what I said earlier, it's in your heart that things spring forth. He trusted the Lord to say, this is your land that you will inherit. And he held on to it. In the same way, <clears throat> we have tough trials. I'm not uh, mitigating that, or I mean, I'm trying to downsize those things. But it's the fact of, hey, as much as it may be annoying or troublesome to have to deal with issues in life, let's turn it around and say, God, another moment, another piece of bread for me to grow even stronger. And I think in times past, I've talked about times like this. You can also see it another way. Imagine if I had a chair here. Too bad I didn't think about that earlier. If I had a chair here, I'd sit down. And that's a picture of rest, just like those of you right now. You're sitting down. You're resting. In the midst of trials, it's the same concept. Sit down and rest. Psalm 23, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of of your enemies, is how Psalm 23 puts it. What do you do at a table? You sit, you eat. You see this, this bread analogy, this eating, this sitting, this resting, that no matter what the enemy is doing, no matter what trials are coming your way, it's rest and see that God will bring victory to this. Now you might be thinking, Ray, that, that is easier said than done. You're right. But we have all the time in the world, so let's use every moment that we can to continue to walk with him and trust wholly in him. <clears throat> because, friend, just as we've sung today in, in many of our songs, the victory is won. His blood was shed on the cross, and because his blood was shed, you are forgiven. That means you are righteous. That means you are his child and that you are loved. Not because of your performance, not because of what you can do or say, but because of what he, Jesus has done. And you are now in him. Life isn't just for you to use your strength to get through. But we can always look to one who actually cares much more and knows it from the beginning, uh, knows it from the end. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows it all. So when you see mountains come your way, would you have the courage, strength, faith, just to say, God, this mountain we're going to take it because you're with me to trust him to walk through it all. And then if you look at the end of verse 12, it may be that the Lord will be with me. When you see that verse, it may be, I get it. In English, it sounds very uh, uh, doubtful. But actually, you can look at all the scholars. You can look in the Hebrew. It actually gives this, it doesn't have that sense of doubt. It's actually saying, if I can put it this way, since the Lord is with me, I shall be able to drive out those giants. Just as the Lord said. There's a confidence there. Verse 13 and 14. 
And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So he got the mountain. And uh, we'll talk about what happens after that, but later. But what I want you to see here is, Caleb, you might be thinking, wow, this guy is amazing. How can I be like someone like him? You know, I don't have his pedigree. I'm not someone who would fight. You might be looking at your age or stage of life. You might be thinking, I'm not qualified. This guy, he's mentioned in the Bible. He is some, like, supreme dude. But you know, in Numbers, when I talked about last week, when he went to go spy out the land, that's the first time you heard his name, Caleb. What happened to the, and he was 40 years old, right? You look at scripture, he was 40 years old at that time. What happened in the last four decades prior to that? Who was he? You might be thinking to yourself, You're, I'm, not, I'm not like so-and-so. I don't have this background or this status. But do you know how Caleb started? Just think about this. Forty years, he experienced some great miracles prior to that. What did God do? He removed his people from Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. The plagues were there. He was a slave. Caleb was born a slave. Nothing to his name. Only asked, to be, only asked to work hard, and he was never treated well. But yet through it all, he still was the one who said, I'm going to wholly follow the Lord. Maybe he didn't even say that, but it's said of him that he wholly followed the Lord because he trusted in him. Now last week, um, I shared um, what I saw from wholly following the Lord. And what does that mean? And I use the example of John uh, chapter 20, 21, 21. Jesus talking to Peter after he had a uh, reconciliation moment, right? Feed my sheep, tend to my sheep, feed my lambs, right? He restores him in that sense. And it was just the fact that because the disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John, the Bible says that it's the disciple whom Jesus loved, he said that of himself because he practiced God's love. He knew who he was, just like Caleb knew who he was and who backed him, and that God was a good God, someone that he could trust. And it was the fact that he naturally just followed the Lord because he knew how good he was. But Peter, on the other hand, was the one who said, no, 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 I will follow you, Jesus, even to death. You know, Peter's always the one that boasts of his love for the Lord. But yet, Peter was the one that Jesus said to him, what is that to you? You follow me. He had to be told to follow Jesus. When the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, who practiced his love, the love of Jesus, was naturally just following so I say all of this not saying, oh, it's another work for you to do, that you need to love God, you need to trust God. No, just dive right in and start to see who Jesus is and see what he has said about you, what he has given to you as, your, as a child of his. As we start to focus more on his goodness and his love for us, you naturally will follow him wholly. You will naturally do the right things at the right time. That's why many times you might hear me talk about the fact that you are forgiven. That you are loved. And that might be, dare I say, boring to you. <laughs> but it's a truth that we need to grasp onto more than ever. More than ever. 
Because we have giants in our lives now, we have mountains in our lives now, and trust me, it's not going to get any better. It's going to keep coming. But how do we face it? How do we deal with it? Like Caleb did. Give me this mountain. Let's take it head on. Because you know what? I'm not alone. Worship team, you can come on up. Friends, uh, we're, we got a couple more weeks looking at the life of Caleb. But right now for today, it is simply saying, the Lord is saying, come to me. This is the verse that's in my head. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Picture that he prepares a table before you in the midst, in the presence of your enemies. That he is the one who is walking with you. He actually wants more for you than you want more good for yourself. Because he loves you that much. He's a lavish father. A lavishly loving savior who wants to pour out so much. And if you think that just because he's so good, that means you know, I could do whatever I want. It's not true. Because the more you know how much he loves you, when you believe it, when you believe right in your heart, it affects your actions. So let's keep focusing on how much he loves you, friends. Amen? Friends, if you're listening online or even in here, you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Friend, he wants to be mightily involved in your life. But he's a gentleman, doesn't force his way in. It's a choice. And so I want to pray with you right now, give you this opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So right where you're seated, if you would, just close your eyes, just bow your heads, and just say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for laying down your son's life for me. I believe that Jesus on the cross took all of my sin and my shame and he died. But on the third day, you rose him from the grave completely free of all my sin. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if that's your first time praying that prayer, do write in to let us know. But welcome to the family of God. Amen. I'm going to hand it off to the worship team. If you're comfortable, you can stand and join us again as we sing Who You Say I Am. Let's just hold on to that promise that, um, that we are God's children. If we've accepted him into our lives, that we can, we can hold on to that truth.
always amazing to see when God chooses the songs. You are his beloved child in whom he is well pleased. Hold on to that this week. And friends, I'm going to pray right now for those who need a healing touch. Right where you are, whatever the issue is, if you feel so comfortable, just open your hands to receive as a posture. Lord, you are such a loving Father. Right now, in Jesus' name, I declare your healing to move forth. And all those who are listening here, and all those who are listening at home, and that, Lord, even if they're listening later, your anointing is here, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, those who have ailments in their bodies right now, whatever it may be, whatever they are dealing with, thank you for ministering your healing right now. I declare that sickness is smitten to its roots. That, Jesus, you are moving to the deepest parts That, Lord, cancer is healed in Jesus' name. That, Lord, there is healing for people's feet. <laughs> Whatever the ailment may be, thank you, Lord, for moving there in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, you're moving in people's internal organs. Father, thank you for showering your healing, Lord. Right now, I declare that in Jesus' name, that those sicknesses are healed right now. Trust you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Friends, as you go forth this week, continue to trust in him in all that you're doing. No matter how big the trial is, the mountain is, no matter how big it is, that you can look to him and walk holy with him because he loves you, all right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom peace. And all the people said, amen. God bless you folks. We'll see you online next week.